Hello students of Dynamics, this is Dr. Dan Baker. And today's lecture, we're actually moving into a new chapter. We're moving into impulse and momentum. Okay, so impulse and momentum is the third way that we can look at kinetics problems. We already looked at Newtonian kinetics, which use F equals MA, so an acceleration-based approach. We also used uh, work and energy in the previous chapter. And now we're moving into impulse and momentum, our third and final approach to kinetics. So one, uh, just to, in brief, impulse momentum focuses on velocities and time versus work energy was velocities and distance. Okay, and all the different um, tools, kinetics tools can handle forces in a variety of ways. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with Newton's second law. It tends to be our favorite place to start our der derivations. And of course, Newton's second law states that the sum of forces is equal to mass times acceleration. Once again, this is an empirical equation, which is often why we come back to it, because there's actually no way to derive this equation. It's based upon measurements. So we also know, um, related to acceleration, that acceleration is the time rate of change, dv dt, time rate of change of the velocity vector. Now, it's not just the magnitude. It turns out it's the full vector. We know that the time rate of change of velocity magnitude is tangential acceleration. Time rate of change of velocity direction is normal acceleration. Okay, so if we do this substitution and we end up with sum of all forces is equal to, now I'm going to put my time rate of change of the entire thing here, right? We had the mass, and then we also substituted in the velocity. So this is going to be mass times velocity vector. And so the way we can say this in words is that the resultant force on a particle which is the left side of the equation, right? Sum of all forces is equal to the time rate of change of the linear momentum. And you'll likely remember from physics that linear momentum is mass times the velocity vector. Okay, so that's this term right in here the linear momentum. And so if we do a separation of variables and take an integral of both sides, okay, separation of variables looks like this. We have sum of forces as a vector bringing the dt over is equal to dmv. And if we integrate both of these, we're left with what's called the impulse momentum equation, where on the left side we have an integral from t1 to t2 of our sum of forces as a vector dt is equal to basically the change in our linear momentum, which we can write as mv2 vector minus mv1 vector. So this is our fundamental equation. I left a little space at the bottom of that box so we could write in the definitions of either side. So this is called our linear impulse. And the right-hand side is the change in linear momentum. So just a contrast this approach, this equation, from our conservation of energy or our work energy equations, one big difference is that this is a vector equation. Okay, so this equation is a vector equation. Which can be split 
into x and y components. Now, if you're saying y, x, y, why don't we go ahead and use tangent normal and r theta? Keep in mind that if here we're talking about a particle at two different times, okay, t1 and t2, that if we chose to use our tangent and normal, that our tangent axes change with location, right? Our tangent and our normal axes change with location, so I have a t and an n at time one, are in a different direction than a t and an n at time two, but x and y, being a non-rotating axis system, are going to be in the exact same directions at time one and time two. Okay, so if we convert all of these terms into x and y, then we can combine them together into one single equation and have our overall reference be consistent. Uh, the other point that I wanted to make is that you remember in work and energy, we kind of had a split of some forces showing up in our energy terms, which is our weight force and our spring force, and some terms showing up, or basically the rest of them showing up in the work terms. Here in impulse and momentum, let's pull a note here that says all forces in the direction of the delta m v, the change in the linear momentum, must be included as impulse. Okay, so including the weight force, including any spring forces, okay, all of the forces. And so this is, again, why we need free body diagrams on every single kinetics problem, whether it's conservation of energy, work energy, impulse momentum, or Newtonian. We need a free body diagram and kinetic diagram on each and every one of those. Just a reminder, free body diagrams have forces. And then our kinetic diagrams, let me just label it here, our kinetic diagrams are actually going to be velocity-based for both impulse momentum and also work energy. So these are our kinetic terms. And on the left over here, I'll put our free body diagram terms. Okay, so a kinetic diagram and a free body diagram. So kind of similar to the Newtonian kinetics chapter where we had forces on one side of the equation and then we had motion on the other, a very similar construct here, just now that we have forces times time, right? An impulse is a force times time. And then we have kinetic being mass times velocity. So this is more dealing with momentum versus our mass times acceleration, okay? So subtle differences, but still a split of forces on one side and kinetic terms on the other. As our overview notes were fairly short for this section, let's go ahead and jump now into an example. So this is a single body example, looking at a 50 pound block. All pounds are pound force. It's initially moving down the slope at three feet per second. There is a bit of kinetic friction, 0.3. And then we have a force. This force is this force P pulling down the slope at a value, a time increasing value of 10 pounds times t, where t is time in seconds. So at zero seconds, it's zero. At one second, it's 10. At two seconds, it's 20, and on up from there. And we want to find its final velocity, the block's final velocity, at two seconds. OK? So the first step, again, on any kinetics problem is to draw a free body diagram. Let's go ahead and draw this box. We have the following forces. We have a weight force. Now, this weight force um, is related to the 30 degree angle of that slope. And I'll add that angle here in just a second. Let's go ahead and get our normal force on here. Draw my normal force along its line of action, project it up, kind of coming out of the centroid. The friction force, now I'm going to draw this, I'll go ahead and draw it down here on the bottom edge. 
Noting that we're treating this block as a particle, we're assuming we're not worrying about its rotation at all. And so I could also have drawn that friction force through the centroid. And then pulling down here, if I think about essentially cutting these cables, right? So if I have a frictionless pulley attached to that box, I'm not only cutting one tension of P, I'm actually cutting two tensions of P. So this is going to be two times P pulling downhill. Now, because we know the 30 degree angle, we also then know, so if this angle here is 30, I also know that this angle here is 30. And that works out well because for this free body diagram, I'm going to establish an axis system. We're going to go with our right hand axis system. So X going up the slope, Y perpendicular to that. So Y basically in the normal force direction and X opposing motion. All right, so there is my free body diagram. And now I can use that to think about which of these terms are going to be impulsive. Right? Remember, impulsive forces are forces which change the momentum in the direction the momentum's going. Now, let's go ahead and make this a kinetic diagram as well by adding in our motion terms. So whether you, want to write, whether you want to write the motion terms as just the velocity or the mass times the velocity, uh, it's up to you. I'm not, I'm not picky on that, but you do need to include both a free body diagram and also a kinetic diagram. Now, the biggest reason that I selected a axis system with my motion going in the X and my Y perpendicular to it is it makes for one, my computations in the Y direction pretty straightforward because there is no change in momentum in the Y direction. And 100% of that velocity is going to be here in the X direction. So I'm going to start with my impulse momentum in the Y direction. Okay, and so another way I can write the impulse momentum is running everything as positive terms. We can put the sum of my mv1 as a vector on the left plus the integral of all the sum of my forces. dt is equal to the sum of my mass times velocity final. Okay, so that's my governing equation. I can split that into an x, split it into a y. Now, the reason I put the summations out front here and here is if we dealt with multiple particles. Now, this problem only has a single particle, but it also would work for multiple particles. All right, so the y version of this equation tells me that my mass times my velocity initial in the y direction plus the integral of the sum of my forces in the y direction dt is equal to my mass times the velocity in the y direction final. Because I don't need that vector arrow above because we've already isolated this into the y direction. All right, so I talked a little bit about earlier about that we've isolated our motion in the x. So we could here say that the velocity in the y given my axis system, initial is zero and final is zero. Okay, so there's no change in momentum. And so what we're left with is we're left with the integral of the sum of forces dt is equal to zero. And it would also work out that if our forces were time constant, right, that integral of the sum of forces dt is basically going to be sum of forces times time. And we could divide the time off both sides. We could end up with the exact same equation we had for statics, sum of forces equal to zero. Now, in this case, we had that P force as time variable. So I do need to leave that integral so that I can compute that. All right, so the forces we have going on in the Y direction. We have the normal force N in the positive Y direction, and we have minus the weight force is 50, now here again, zooming in, we have this angle, right? So this angle here is also 30 degrees. So as I take a look at a little triangle, the cosine component is gonna be in the Y direction. So uh, 50 times the cosine of 30 degrees, this is equal to zero. Therefore, we can find that our normal force is equal to a constant value of 43.3 pounds. So we'll need that normal force so we can factor in our friction, our kinetic friction in the 
x direction impulse momentum equation. So we have x, and basically using that same format, my initial momentum. Now, because your velocity is a vector term, you need to bring in signs for the velocity, just like you bring in signs for the forces. Okay, so first thing here is I'm going to have my mass in U.S. customary units. I stated this was 50 pounds. It's a pound force. I'm going to divide that by 32.2. I'll convert into slugs. So my velocity here is minus 3. Minus because the velocity here and the x-axis are going in opposite directions. Then we have our impulse. Now the impulse is a series of terms and the friction force will be positive, and both the weight component and the P force will be negative. So let's go with the friction force first. So we'll put here plus. The friction force, of course, is equal to mu sub k times n. So our normal force was 43.3. Our friction coefficient of 0 0.3. Now that's the force, the friction force, but the impulse is force times time. Okay, this times two seconds. Now, I also could use a similar format for the impulse of the weight. It is going to be negative because it is pulling in the opposite direction, or its x component is pulling opposite direction of the x-axis. So this is going to be the weight of 50, and this is going to be the sine of 30 degrees, again, times the impulse two seconds and then I'm also going to have my 2p force so I put a negative out front because it's opposing the x-axis and of course p was equal to 10 times t this can be from 0 to 2 seconds dt and again equal to mass times the velocity so 50 divided by 32.2 and the final velocity in this case is unknown v2 Okay, so after we perform this integral, we end up with the following terms. We have a momentum equal to a value of 4.658, and that technically in U.S. customer units is in slug feet per second, right? Mass times velocity, which is mass times distance divided by time. And then for our friction force, we end up with a value of positive 25.98. And then, of course, sine of 30 is a half, and a half times 2 is 1. And so we end up with minus 50 out of that next term. Now, look at my integral. I just picked up that I had an error before I compute that integral. And the error is the fact that I have 2 times p. I only listed the value of p on its own, and so to take this as 2 times p, I take 2 times 10, okay, so 20t dt, and performing that integral, we end up getting a value of negative 40, as we take 20t squared divided by 2, evaluated from 0 to 2 seconds, and then 50 divided by 32.2 is 1.55. V2. So V2 is my unknown, and I find the final velocity is equal to negative 44.3 feet per second. Now, noting I came up with a negative value, why did I get a negative value? And the reason is right here. I wrote this V2 as a positive V2, which fundamentally is assuming that my final velocity is going in the direction of the x-axis, which is going upslope in this problem. We know that there's no way, if it's already going downslope and P is pulling super hard and all it's resisting it is friction, this can go faster and faster downslope. And so if I put that value in as a negative V2 and solve for it, I would end up here getting a positive value. So this is just one of those cases where we're confirming an incorrect assumption, right? Or we're informing an incorrect assumption of the direction of V2. So just really watch for it that all of the vector terms, and it doesn't matter if it's velocities or accelerations in other sections, that all vector terms come from this free body diagram slash kinetic diagram. So make sure that you are bringing in those negative values. Okay, so we end up with a large value 
um, of this box coming down the slope. And now we could solve this as well if you're thinking like, why didn't we solve this using Newtonian kinetics, right? Acceleration-based approach. You would have got the exact same answer. Turns out the exact same way. It's just taking a different approach to solve the same problem. Thanks for your attention today. <laughs>